Hello and welcome back to Faith Evolving. Today we're going to be talking about critical theory and things people get wrong about it that then they used to say that it isn't a thing and it makes me confused. I'm boldly recording during the day. Usually I record at night so I can control the lighting a little bit more. So if I'm overexposed, blame the sun, and I guess you can blame me. But yeah, critical theory. For those of you who don't know, I don't know if you can tell this by the unnecessarily large vocabulary. I flex all the time. Usually it's pretty unconscious. I know I come across as very pretentious. That is only partially true. I'm kind of pretentious. I'm sorry. But I'm about to graduate from undergrad and I have a minor in philosophy. So I have encountered critical theory quite a few times in the wild seen it in people's writings, how they employ it, and it is not a set of doctrinal beliefs. It's actually an approach, kind of like a mode of analyzing the world. I told my dad I was doing a video about critical theory and he gave me this huge book that I read a couple essays in. Not the whole thing, um, because not the whole thing. I'm a thick bitch. Critical theory, a lot of it had to do with analyzing literature, about being like, huh, what are these terms? What are these ideas that we've made classifications? Do they serve us? Are they valid? What are some potential problems with it? Should we dismantle them? Should we keep them? Critical theory. Critical comes from, you know, criticism, analyzing the good and bad in something and evaluating it. And then theory, just, I don't know, it's, it's a theory. And yes, this reflective assessment of society often leads to challenging power structures, which is more of like the buzzword part of critical theory that we see in a lot of Twitter arguments. But because it's become a buzzword, there's a lot of misinformation about what it actually is. And it doesn't help that it's super hard to define what it is. It's better to see what it's not. And there's this video that does a really good job to me of encompassing a lot of the apologetic approach to why critical theory should just be completely thrown out. And the title of the video is Critical Theory Biblical um, by this channel, What Would You Say? And the whole thing is when someone starts talking about critical theory and you want to be like, no, here are three things in your arsenal that you can prove them wrong with. So the video starts like this. You're in a conversation and someone says, since God cares about the oppressed, Christians should embrace critical theory because it's trying to eliminate oppression too. What would you say? Um, yep. Actually, yeah, I'd say great job at explaining. <laughs> to understand critical theory, we need to understand its two primary claims. So like I said before, critical theory is not a doctrine. It has no primary claims. It helps people come to conclusions often that could be those claims. And I understand from a philosophical argument and how you craft that, why they brought up this whole claim thing. So you set it up so then you can dispute them. So I'm not gonna get in their grill too much about that because what they kind of pooled as their two primary claims aren't untrue, that that's usually the conclusion drawn when we analyze power structures. First, everyone can be divided into two groups, those who have power and those who don't. Like obviously, if there is an oppressed group, there has to be something that's oppressing them. And if there's oppressors, they have to had oppressed something to get that qualifier. Additionally, with the first claim, is very binary thinking. You either have power or you don't, which is very interesting to me because later they dive into the concept of intersectionality, but whatever. Second, those who have power always oppress those who don't. The thing that I take issue with is this always language, that these states of being are inherent. It just is what it is. We can't do anything about it. That's not what critical theory claims at all. It's more, these are observable trends that we have habituated. Let's talk about them. We as humans don't have to live this way. We just keep doing it. It's not necessary that society operates this way. According to critical theory, the categories of oppressor and oppressed are based on your group identity. Things like race, gender, religion, immigration status, income, sexual orientation, and gender identity determine whether we are oppressed or one of the oppressors. 
those groupings are human made. Like that's a human decision. Groupings were created off of common experiences that actually affect the way that you interact with the world and the world interacts with you. All of those qualities that a person might have that he lists are things that impact the way that we interact with the world and the world interacts with us. They're not just arbitrarily assigned. We kind of craft and mold people into the need to have these groups. And that's how they're a bit of a double-edged sword. I will give criticisms of group identity that, like that's something that we should really think about. People and groups are a monolith, we're not all the same, it can help us understand communities better, but also make generalizations about just swaths of people that might not be true. And so it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. The thing is, this video thinks that critical theory celebrates that, when actually critical theory is about exposing that and starting a conversation on how we can make it better. Someone might be part of an oppressed group in one way, but one of the oppressors in another way. That's where the concept of intersectionality comes in. Intersectionality seeks to measure someone's level of oppression based on how many of these groups they identify with. This actually isn't a terrible definition of intersectionality. The thing I take issue with, once again, kind of pedantic, kind of, you know, nitpicking, but the idea of measuring someone's oppression, it's not so much to quantify it, like, ha ha ha, I'm less oppressed or I'm more oppressed than you. It's to understand how the overlap and experiences interact with each other um, in different ways. Not about measuring. Not about measuring, <laughs> necessarily. In critical theory, the degree to which you are oppressed determines your level of moral authority. This is where this video takes a turn. No, <laughs> that's not. Overall, anything I've read has nothing to do with moral authority at all. So the word authority comes from author. And with authority, it's this idea that the person who writes the story has control over it. And yes, historically, the straight white man has had more authority over things. They're the people that write history, and at least our Western reading of history. But the moral part of it, no one's claiming anything about moral authority. It's about listening to other people's experiences. The more categories of oppression someone identifies with, the more moral authority they have. As a result, the experience and perspective of a gay black woman is more valuable than the experience and perspective of a straight white man, regardless of what they have to say. It's not about going from one tip of the scale to the other one, it's about balancing the scale out. And we have this scarcity mindset. So yeah, if you have to give some stuff up to balance it out, it's gonna feel like you're losing authority, but you're not. You're just making space for other people or just listening to other people and be like, oh, what you have to say about your lived experience is more important if I haven't experienced that thing and vice versa. That's. That's it. A gay black woman's experience is more valuable when it comes to issues about being gay or being black or being a woman than a straight white man's does. But a straight white man's perspective is more valued and more important for things regarding being straight, being white, or being a man. Like, that's, that's what we're trying to say. Listen to the people that have expertise in that area. And in the same way, the more oppressed someone is, the less moral responsibility they have. No one is claiming that. It's just historically, the straight white men have been the oppressors, and in order to be an oppressor, you have shirked your moral responsibility. It's just time to do the work now, to balance the scales. And in that, we have a Foucault quote that I found very, very fitting. It seems to me that the themes destined to replace the privileged person accorded the author have merely served to arrest the possibility of genuine change. And that's what this video to me feels like. It's making stuff up so you don't have to change your behavior at all. To me, critical theory is all about listening. It's not about determining who's better than the other person. That's the whole thing we're trying to get rid of. Those who aren't part of oppressed groups, straight white men, gain moral authority by surrendering to those who haven't, the oppressed. And this is called being woke. 
this feels like parody. I <laughs> Every time I hear that, I'm like, what? Do they realize how ridiculous that sounds? I, again, it's not about surrendering necessarily. It's about understanding that other people's perspectives also matter. Some people claim that since Jesus cares about oppression, critical theory and intersectionality should be embraced by Christians. Yeah, maybe not embraced without critique, but you know, utilized or considered for sure. I think that'd be great. We should do that. Critical theory and intersectionality are not consistent with Christianity. And here are three reasons why. The way that I would beg to differ. And that's where we get into the real meat and potatoes of this video. First, critical theory offers a different view of humanity than Christianity. Critical theory pits some groups of people against other groups based on their status as oppressors or oppressed. The Bible says that we are all equal before God. Created equal, equally valuable, equally guilty of sin, equally deserving of punishment, and equally able to find grace and mercy in Jesus. No, critical theory exposes the ways that we've fallen short. You can believe, and part of this comes from an ideal that all human beings are created equally. That's the hope. We look at the various identifiers that society has given us to understand, again, the ways in which we've screwed up and we've messed up, and the areas in which we need to fix that. That's what it is. It's not, I am more holy than you. That, that's just flipping the hierarchy instead of saying we shouldn't have a hierarchy, which is what the end goal of critical theory is. Critical theory offers a different view of sin than Christianity. Okay, possibly controversial. I somewhat agree with this point in the sense that there is a different kind of perception of sin in a lot of people that embrace critical theory than a lot of people who don't that are Christians. But the ways in which it's different that this video presents, I don't agree with. The Bible identifies sin as anything that violates God's design for people, including unjust oppression of other people. But critical theory identifies sin only as oppression. See, to me, to oppress someone requires all of the other sins. In my White Supremacy is a Sin video, I talk about how to me, the umbrella of all sin is supremacy, of thinking that you are better than someone else. To hate someone, to objectify someone, to murder someone, to steal from someone, you have to have a loftier view of yourself. And that's what sin is. And that is, you know, defying God. But watch my other video for that theory to be explained a little bit more. I'm still fleshing it out. It's evolving. Kind of agree, kind of disagree. Let's hear more about this point. As a result, advocates of critical theory would see biblical practices such as discipleship, correction, leadership, and reproof as sinful assertions of power if the speaker is among the oppressors. Literally no. Once again, never heard anyone claim this. It's only if they're using those traits or those skills to oppress people. If they're using those skills and they're in a place of privilege because society has put them there and they're wielding their privilege to get rid of privilege and to call things out, then no, they're doing great. That's great. Have leadership skills, disciple people. Critical theory isn't trying to attack white men. It's trying to stop white men from attacking people. Critical theory offers a different view of salvation than Christianity. Because critical theory teaches that oppressors are guilty and the oppressed are not, salvation for the oppressed is found not through repentance, but in social liberation here and now. So repentance is a form of liberation because it's turning from the terrible thing that you're doing and it's righting the wrongs as part of repentance. And so it's this idea that being an oppressor and being an oppressed, it like hurts the humanity of both. And there's this awesome quote by an Aboriginal woman, Lilla Watson. And the quote is, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. And this notion that it's repentance or social liberation, instead of the two being bound together is very reflective of this prioritization of guilt over conviction and doing something about it. Their hope is only through activism. In other words, critical theory has a completely different understanding of who we are, what the problem is, and how to fix it. 
than Christianity. Understanding of salvation differs among Christians. Christianity also isn't a monolith. There's these ideas that are prevalent of heaven on earth, of the kingdom of God, about living out these themes and these commandments in the Bible right now. Repentance in the here and now to the people that we've hurt and are still harming, not just to God. Both. So if you say that Christians should embrace critical theory because God cares about the oppressed and someone comes at you with these three things, here's what you say. Read critical theory before you talk about it. I'm just kidding. That would be annoying. You would say, where did you get your information about critical theory? You would say, what do you think critical theory is? And then look it up together. Like I said at the top, I've studied philosophy and what I've learned about philosophical concepts and theories is that no singular one gets the whole thing right. Someone presents an idea and then another person comes along and they're like, here's what you missed. And then they present a thing and someone comes along and they're like, here's what you missed. And it keeps going and going and going forever. So critical theory has some really interesting critiques of it, but this ain't it. And I don't think it's the end all be all of everything that is good, but it's a really interesting tool we can use to create heaven on earth. And isn't that beautiful? So this has been Critical Theory Exposed. Like, comment, and subscribe, especially if you want to see more of these videos or have more people see this video. Critical Theory isn't the boogeyman. Bye!